Are you a leader in customer success, pre-sales, professional services, support? Do you work behind the scenes and roll up your sleeves to make sure that customers are happy? Renew. Then this is for you. Welcome to the GSD Podcast. Welcome to the GSD Podcast. Getting it done. Services, success, and software. We'll talk with the pros that have been in the trenches, getting service teams off the ground, launching new types of groups to service customers, or running agencies that don't have a product attached to it. For the pros, by the pros. This is the GSD Podcast, and this is your host, Jeff Kushmerick. Hey there, it's Jeff uh, from Getting Services Done Podcast. Got my next episode coming up here. And one of the great things about starting this uh, podcast is I've heard from a lot of people that I hadn't chatted with in a while. We've all been super busy with our families and our careers. And uh, Bill Whitebone, we were project managers together at uh, in DECA, I believe I hadn't really talked or seen him since I think 2006 or seven. I, I feel like I bumped into him in the hallways of, of Vistaprint one time, but, um, anyways, we, we got together for lunch one time or coffee and we just started, you know, shooting the shit and going over stuff. And suddenly I was like, crap, I really wish I had brought in a microphone and recorded some of this. Uh, so we got back together last week and we went over really just a lot of stuff. Bill's done some great things. He was obviously in professional services, went to do some uh, actual physical product stuff at Vistaprint and some other places and is able to give that sort of product and professional services perspective. And now he's uh, often consulting. He also led a, a large group of people over at Acquia uh, they used a lot of partners to do a delivery in their work. So he's got some good perspective on partners and using offshore components and just all in all a, a great recording with a, with a great guy. So it was, it was a blast to do. I hope you enjoy. I will try and get my show notes out there. I, the reason why this is a little later is that I had sent this over to somebody on Fiverr that I had found and then uh, he couldn't complete it because he had, I guess, college exams. So I just wanted to get this out there, but uh, I'll get some show notes up on Medium soon. Uh, so uh, feel free to fire any questions in and thanks a lot. All right, so we are recording. Uh, this is Jeff Kushmarek, and I'm here with the Bill Whitebone, which is one of the great things I found from when I started this podcast out is that I've gotten to chat with a lot of people that I hadn't talked to in a while, and Bill had reached out to me, and, and I swear to God, we hadn't talked to each other <laughs> by 2008. Exactly. <laughs> which is great. Um, and then we got together for a cup of coffee, and I was like, Jesus, why didn't I bring <laughs> microphone but but then i was like well we got into some stuff that we probably wouldn't <laughs> get rid of well just nothing bad it's just names and you know like, hey what's going on with this guy and stuff that's total inside baseball that that people probably don't want to hear and everything um so bill uh i have lots of stuff to to chat about i'll try and keep it under the hour um but why don't you tell me so first things i would i forgot even what you did before we worked together at indeca we we're both project yeah. leaders, and I feel like there's a point in time where we're actually sitting next to each other. <laughs> if yeah. that's a memory, it's hard because you know we moved offices and things like that. So yeah, no, I do remember that myself. Yeah, so before I got to Indeca, I was actually at Digitas. Uh, so right. I was, yeah, so I was at Digitas for about four years, and uh, I really it's an interesting story actually how I ended up at Digitas. I was at the MathWorks, so I was doing uh, web development at the MathWorks. Math My brother was at the MathWorks. <laughs> I was there briefly, so it was, it was, it was the hot time, right? So that everybody was, uh, was looking for that next opportunity. Yeah. So I was at the MathWorks for six months, and Digitas approached me and said, hey, how about we give you 50% more compensation uh, and you come over here and, uh, and do some project management, not just do uh, development. So, <laughs> so that's, that's good. Getting paid more money is a good thing. Or? It's, it worked out well. Yeah, it was, it was definitely, <laughs> definitely something that was of interest to me. 
Uh, you know what? Now that you've said the Digitas thing, um, I now remember that because there was a point in time where people were like, we need real project managers. <laughs> <laughs> like exactly so i'm like wow we're getting some real legit people in here <laughs> like you know, i'll just step over here for now <laughs> so yep yep absolutely and what they said to me I, I at the time i was purely developing and i they said you can be 50 percent developer 50 percent project manager yep. and from day one i never did another line of code um, <laughs> pure project management from day one and, that, and that's what i did uh which i'm i'm happy about i'm, I'm glad yeah. Uh, the way things have progressed and it was a, it was a good start as far as project management for me. So that's, that's where I was before. So working with big clients like, uh, FedEx, uh, worked with Boeing, worked oh, with, yeah. um, so some really interesting projects, uh, and then ended up, uh, moving over to Indeco was looking for something smaller and actually did a little bit of consulting in between, which was interesting. Too. Oh, yeah. So, uh, and just so people aren't familiar. So Indeco, where Bill and I worked, we basically were, uh, on the uh, professional services team for a product company at the time the product um, no SaaS model nobody even knew what that was it was basically you're deploying a server somewhere and then building up a user interface on it and it's also you know, the, the thing that drives their whole customer experience um, so my question to you actually from people coming from an agency background into that what were the sort of the big shifts that you noticed from there? Yeah, so something that I really realized at Digitas uh, was that when you're working at an agency, you know everything, right? So that's, that, that's the way you approach everything. That's the, you're, you're looking for whatever work comes your way and you'll make it happen. And there was a lot of making it happen. Uh, so we, there was instances where there was products that we had never used that I would go get trained after we just after we sold the deal. Uh, right. So oh, interesting. right. Like, like, Oh, go learn site core or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, there were multiple instances that that, that happened. Uh, so I, I would become the expert as I was doing the work. Uh, so in that <laughs> customers course, never knowing that. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> always, always been working with this. I've always been an expert with it. It's well worth what you're paying. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't 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 hire one of your people to learn it pay us so i can go learn it and charge <laughs> it absolutely absolutely <laughs> yeah so so being at indeca was it was very different right that we we were the experts we actually worked only in this product right. and we knew it inside and out right so that that was something that was really different for me was to have that that focus on one product be doing the same thing on a day-to-day -day basis too that yeah. that was I felt like I was I was the classic, uh, the the classic person who had lots of experience, broad experience, um, but didn't have the, the depth of experience while I was in the agency world. Right. Uh, and then moving over, I I did know the product inside and out. The people I worked with all knew details, amazing details about it. So yeah. I, I really liked that, and it was a, a distinctly different experience. Yeah, you you mentioned that expertise. I forgot about that because we kind of had to be. We had to, we, the hats we wore were um, project management, uh, business ana analysis, uh, I think account management and customer success because there was none of that, right? It was yeah. just basically you got an account and you ran it and you occasionally heard from the salesperson uh, when it was getting close to renewal if everything was okay. Exactly, you know? exactly. Yeah. And those are the old days of customer success before customer success was called what it is now, right? So yeah. It's, it was from inception to ongoing support that, that right. we were we you know we were representing for the for indeca and you came on and if i remember uh and i believe it was a credit card company but it was like you were sort of you were sort of program managing a whole bunch of things am i correct on that one like you had this really big customer that you kind of had uh, as well or I'm talking right. about American Express, I believe. Was that yours? or am I American Express was mine at when I was at Digitas. I was working at American Express. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't at Indeca. Uh, I, I had a whole breadth of different uh, clients when I was in Indeca, which was, was really interesting. You know, they, they ran from very large to, to very small. I remember one was a huge, uh, huge timeshare company uh, or timeshare uh, rental company uh, that that was that was a really challenging one actually the yeah. most interesting one for me was AutoZone um, so oh, yeah oh my god yeah that's right yeah. forgot about that I'm a car guy so AutoZone yeah. was my dream but I I ran into things uh, concerning vehicles that I had never uh, seen as challenges the hierarchy of vehicles is one of the most challenging things in the world I think 
Oh my God. Number of well, vari variations in vehicles was such a challenge for us to implement. Yeah, there, we, you know, we, we were a big pipeline back into the product because we we're out there trying to implement it. And it's like, look, this is real world. These, these are the categories that they have and we have to make it work, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. It's yeah. funny you said that, but for some bizarre reason, I was always getting put on these adult product, product projects. I don't know why you never got those. But. <laughs> I do remember that one. I, I've told that story to this day. <laughs> Who wants to work on this? Uh, this is the uh, the gist of what it is. And in you're the dark to... room. Yes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Closed door. <laughs> oh man! And then the funny the word to top that one off. When I was at Brightco, um, we signed up um, Playboy as a customer, and uh, I had no male project managers. Uh, so, <laughs> but why I had this one awesome uh, female? She's like, I'll take it. They're, they'll be fun to hang out with. I was like, Oh my god! And then everybody's like, You did what? I'm like, Listen, get it. You know, that's okay. You got to do. Gotta do. You gotta do. <laughs> so, so walk me through after. I believe is that when you went to go work for a product company after that? Um, is that when you went over to Vistaprint? Yes. Through yeah. Dega. Yeah, so yeah, I went over to Vistaprint. Uh, Vistaprint was uh, was really different for me. I uh, I started there as a program manager, and the first program that I managed was actually a, a physical product. So mm -hmm. I, I had never in my career created a physical product. Uh, so it was everything was digital. So they told me that they wanted to start making customized mugs. Uh, so not only was it a, a hard product for me that I was producing, but it actually was the first FDA controlled product that they were, they were putting out. Mugs were FDA controlled? Yeah, so because they, they, they actually touch your mouth, uh, you need to oh. make sure that, they, that that product doesn't have any contaminants in it that would be bad for you. That's uh, crazy. I, you know, it's funny you bring that up. I just, just yesterday was, you know, I was like starving and I you know, like ran into like Whole Foods and I grabbed like those Justin Almond butter packets or whatever. Yeah. And I just like rip it open and squeeze it, you know, and suck it down. I'm like, you like, this is so disgusting. Like somebody else probably had it in their hands and said, screw it. And then I pick it up and buy it and just, oh God. So exactly. I can see where that needs the FDA comply. So I want to touch on one of my favorite themes uh, and see if it's valid or if I just, I'm a jerk. And uh, <laughs> the truth is always somewhere in the middle. But, you know, we had some pretty hard, like just real hard driving workers, I believe, at Deco. We were all had that unified goal. And then I found when I then work with product only teams that there's a little bit of a different work mentality uh and did you do you bump into that when you were started working at vistaprint with a physical product and not having this client deadline that was sort of like a, a bullet to your head and stuff like that or yeah it, it was different so if i the things that were similar is and the key to any place that i've worked and wanted to work has been working with really smart and dedicated people so that was something that was really appealing to me about the vistaprint team as i got to mm -hmm. know them uh, so that that was the same, uh, but when I when I look at the the level of dedication in general, uh, being at a small company like Indeco, where you know, we were very early on, yeah. just, you had a different connection to it, right? So uh, Vistaprint, very dedicated people, dedicated people, lots of great work. I think it's a great company, but a different feel because of the scale of it when I joined. So mm -hmm. Indeco, I just felt like was it was different in that we all had that common goal of growing this as quickly as we possibly could. Whereas I felt like Vistaprint was in a place of excellence, right? So right. the point of wanting to create absolute excellence uh, and in that case, it was more, just when we were there, it was more scrappy, yeah. really get done, move things as quickly as we possibly can and put out a, high, a very high quality product. Yep. Uh, so it is it different, different mentality, different stage of, of company. And it took some, it took some getting used to for me. So I, I it felt like it, you, you touched on it. It felt like a different pace essentially. Yeah. And a lot of what had to happen uh, was me motivating myself more than the, the just all around insanity yeah. motivating me. But yeah, like sometimes it's okay not to have like your world just on fire every day. <laughs> like yeah, you get this out and I've got three other projects and they're all like, let's go, let's go, let's go. It's I'm now as a, you're probably the fourth or fifth person I've talked about this with. I'm realizing that I'm perhaps the problem. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. I'll meditate on that one. So, <laughs> so that was great. So you were there for how long? Cause I, you, I want to start getting into the, 
really large scale stuff that we talked about because uh, I'm, I'm over my skis where you sort of went in terms of experience with really big teams and things like that. So I'm going to start. Right. So I was, I was at Vista Print until 2011. So I was there for uh, four yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and kind of like another interesting thing that just to, to touch on is that I did that physical product and then I ended up back in my realm uh, while I was there in that I went to strategic partnerships. Uh, oh, right. That's right. Yeah, it was focused on implementing third-party uh, third party options, third-party products on the Vistaprint site, and then also offering the Vistaprint site in different ways. So uh, white-labeled for Staples, uh, white-labeled for FedEx Office. So I ended up getting back into essentially consulting, right? So right. leading a team that was very similar. Well, and it's funny you touched on it, but um, and I actually really haven't discussed this that much so far, which is one of the things that we wind up doing at product companies in, and I don't think as much as with service companies, but, but basically there's a point in time where you're not supposed to grow your services team anymore. Uh, and you need to start finding strategic partners uh, to, to implement a lot of the work. Uh, there's just certain things with evaluations of companies that they don't want you having this massive services team because then it looks like a really difficult and complicated thing to deploy, um, which in tech it was, but we still needed to, have, there's also another thing where if you start bringing on um, strategic partners like you're talking about, they can, they can sell into their customers as well. Like the example, like we would never sell into Coca-Cola, but Accenture would. So let's get Accenture ramped up on, on this and that. But uh, I really like working with the, the small regional providers. Uh, and, and, I, and I don't know if you sort of had, had any thoughts on that, because I know you worked with them a lot when we were at Tech, but I don't know if that happened with Vistaprint at all. Uh, so actually, that'd be a good segue into Acquia. So Acquia, oh, yeah, yeah. That's, right. that's where it was. That was what it was all about for me. And that, that was okay. a, a big change in that Acquia's focus was really on building the Drupal, the overall Drupal ecosystem. Yep. So in order to build that ecosystem, they needed to, to have lots of folks deeply involved and they wanted to get more and more, which meant that from a services perspective, we didn't want to build a big services team. We actually wanted to build a services team that leveraged third parties to empower those third parties to be out evangelizing and, and actually growing Drupal mm -hmm. in general. So I only had engagement managers, so very, very senior project managers and technical architects on my team. Oh, okay. Um, actually, the, employ the actual employees. Uh, and then we used third parties to do the majority of our delivery. I'd say, yeah, I'd say all of our delivery, essentially, other than wow. the, the top leadership. Uh, let's, let's dive into that a little bit because I, I hadn't realized that. And um, How did you manage, because I've, I've dealt, certainly dealt with the sort of split projects and stuff like that, but how did you keep those partners on track? Uh, obviously you had some high level engagement managers there, but uh, I'm just wondering, let's talk about like you know, five minutes, like the life cycle of one of those projects and making sure that these outside developers were delivering the quality and doing all the things that you needed them to do. Sure. Yes. It, a really important part of leveraging third parties effectively is getting them involved early. Yep. So making sure that they're part of the estimation process. So generally what we would do is we would, we would engage with the client. Uh, we'd get the relationship going with the client. We'd get the initial requirements. And then we would decide what partner would be the best based on what the need was of that, that particular client. Uh, so at that point, we'd bring the partner and have them estimate and also connect directly with the client if, if needed. We'd be a part of all those conversations, but connect directly to get more details. Uh, so they would actually come up with an estimate. We'd compare our estimate to their estimate and some, usually end up in the middle somewhere. Whose uh, paper Whose paper was it on? It was on our paper. Okay. Yeah, so the we, other responsibility. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. So they would contract with us and then we were always contracted with the client. Uh, so from there, the delivery process uh, would be overseen by my engagement manager and by my technical architect. Uh, yeah. But the day-to-day -day delivery was being managed by a project manager on the other side. Okay, so they were setting up sort of a good relationship with the, between the engagement manager and the project manager. And this is this is a little for everybody listening. Like this is before the days of like daily stand-ups and Slack and hip chat and everything else. So it's a little bit of I don't know. I just used to always lose my mind on these projects. But uh, you know, because you just <laughs> are they working? You're like. <laughs> <laughs> How's the delivery going? Or you know, you just, you just, I never had a good feel for them. So 
Yeah, exactly. We, we didn't, you're right. We didn't have that direct immediate connect, uh, connection consistently. So it was really setting up regular calls. Uh, so then the calls weren't on, of daily frequency necessarily, but they were at least a couple times a week yeah. um, hitting on the, the right or most important details of, of progress. Uh, but <laughs> you and I actually discussed this briefly when we, uh, we met, we met up, but I'll give you an example of when things don't work. Uh, <laughs> no, it's perfect because you learn so much more when, you know, everything just blows up in front of you. Like, oh, let's not do that again. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the most challenging projects, clients that I worked with uh, at Aquio was definitely NBC Sports um, they, and doing the Olympics. Uh, so we did the Olympics website right. for NBC Sports. Uh, yeah. Great, great group, uh, but under a lot of stress, right? So that yeah. we're talking about so much money that is dependent on this site being fully functional and being full, fully functional on the date that it needs to be and consistently up. Yeah. So they, they really wanted to make sure that we were hitting deadlines and, and that we were, we were on the right track. So we, we ended up in a situation where the third party that was implementing started to fall behind. They, of course, started to fall behind when the biggest convention for Drupal uh, of the year was happening. So I was at DrupalCon in Denver, and so was the third party that was supposed to do the delivery. And I had some conversations around, we need to speed this up. We need to get going on this yeah. right now. And my client was at DrupalCon. My CEO was at DrupalCon. Uh, so really easy to get us all in a, in a room. And we did all get into a room. Uh, and it was a highly stressful meeting. Uh, so... I was under a lot of pressure and so I started to put that pressure or additional pressure onto the third party and they told me that they were a lifestyle business uh, and that one of the things that was really important to them was to be able to spend time at this convention and focus on the convention. Mm -hmm. uh, so not the answer I necessarily wanted to hear at the time. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that you run into though, when you're working with third parties, you don't know what the culture of their organization is. Right. And that culture was very different from the culture that I was working in and the culture of my client. Uh, so it, it got done. We, we were 100% successful, uh, but only because we switched out to another, another company to, to take. Oh, you did switch out. I didn't realize that I was, I, I, we didn't cover that when we chatted. Yeah. Wow. That must've been. I think I, was, I think you're growing hives right now, just telling me the story right now. We'll get on <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Oh. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was a, one of the more challenging times in my my career for sure, and uh, oh. and it worked out. But we found a th another third party delivery company that was very very capable uh, and came in quickly and, and got the work done at high quality. Yeah, I, listen, I'm all about lifestyle, but you know. Sometimes you got to get the job. I, you know, it's terrible, especially when you're a project manager and your like team is sitting with you. And I'm like, oh, you guys going out to lunch? I'll get you lunch. I'll bring lunch. Like, you don't want anything to distract you when exactly. you have one of those. Unfortunately, like this is the deadline. There's nothing you can do about it. It's right. You know, it's nice to be able to say, well, you know, we haven't gathered requirements and we can't go forward with a deadline. But there's a certain point in time where your company makes a decision, like in order to get this deal, we're gonna have to oh run it hot i say it with quotes on and then you get a partner and they don't run it hot so yeah yeah and, and i had no backstop right i didn't yeah. i had no i had my tech architects right but they didn't have capacity because they had so many projects they were managing simultaneously yeah so really i had no backstop and that was that was one of the biggest challenges is that the only way to protect yourself was to bring another third party in and get them ramped quickly if, if one wasn't working out so that happened didn't happen frequently, but it did happen several times. And, and that's, a, that's a really tough position to be in because you're having to ramp a new team quickly. You're having to tell another team to take a hike uh, and also tell them you're not going to pay them uh, for any, any additional work and maybe some of the work they've already done because it wasn't of high quality or, right. or wasn't delivered on time. Uh, so did, did, tough you have, oh, sorry. did you have a um, sort of, was there like a partner guy or person that was sort of creating these relationships or were you out there finding them for yourself? So the partner group started to grow as probably year two uh, when I was there, the partner group started to grow. So when I started, it was really project managers were, as we talked about earlier, they were like in DECA, they were responsible for everything, right? Yep. Uh, and, and really, I, and then it rolled up to me as far as the longer term relationships. Uh, but yeah, partners, be, partnerships became very important at that point, um, really focusing on going larger scale too. So instead of working just with these, open source shops that was focused on starting to grow into to bigger consulting, right? And bigger consulting yeah. 
was seen as being able to bring more opportunities. Um, was that the reality? Not necessarily, um, but I saw that it was the right trajectory, definitely. Right. More partnerships. What's, and we're going to talk about the set for a while. There's a bunch of topics here. Yeah. One of them, I'm curious, how big was your team there underneath you at that time? Uh, so my team at Max was about 100 people. Yeah, that's a good size. What sort of management structure do you have in place in terms of like tiered or, you know, like how many, what's your philosophy on how many direct reports a manager should have, first of all? My view is, I mean, it really depends on what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. but I, I usually stick by 10 to 12 is the, the max. Uh, I'd rather see somewhere around eight if you're going to be effective. And it really depends on what you're trying to do too. So yeah. if you look at a project manager or a program manager that's managing project managers, uh, you, you probably want to uh, focus more on the junior folks, right? And if you have a very yeah. junior team, you're going to want less numbers. And that, that's what I'm kind of looking at. What are we trying to accomplish here? Are we maintaining some senior people and trying to grow them as we can, uh, right. or are we really trying to grow some junior people really quickly? Uh, and it, it really depends. Yeah, I think with the 10 to 12, I, I think at that point in time, you need a bunch of senior people. Like with those, numbers. for me, like I'm sort of more in the six to eight tops camps. Uh, uh, but, you know, I've been in these, these roles where you're hiring some more junior people and bringing them on board. So you got to kind of give them a little bit more like, you know, not just the one-on-ones. You've got people walking into your office like, hey, can I bounce something off of you and, and all that stuff. But, Absolutely. Uh, but I, you guys were growing to a big size at that point in time. So you could probably bring in some more senior people and you, know, you can say, here's a chunk of work. And then maybe I'm guessing have like a couple junior people that you can then work on bringing up. So, yeah, that's really been my strategy on going is, is to start to build a team with very senior people. And then as you see, you have some capacity, then start to bring the more junior folks in. And sometimes you may start to go towards the more junior folks more quickly because you're looking at margins and margins need to, to come yeah. up, right? So that's sometimes that, but having capacity to one support and two grow junior people is, re is really important. So you need to do it at the right time. Actually, this made me think of a topic because you know, you always hear from, from the upper management, they're like, oh, well, we have all these smaller customers, right? Right. <laughs> Please tell the audience why that's always a disaster. <laughs> Let's put the most junior person on the chief of projects. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, you and I both know, and every probably many people listening to this know that your most challenging clients are your smallest clients. <laughs> and wait, they're only paying us thirty k. Just put the seventy k project manager on. That makes total sense. Right, because they'll nail that budget. They will nail that budget. <laughs> yeah, I, I've I've seen that many times, but yeah, we we know that. I mean, that's again customer success. You talk about customer success, and that that's. Yeah from every customer success person that the the clients that are using the, the majority of their time are those small clients oh yeah they just it, it's nothing against the small it's not even the contract value it's more it's just this usual indicator that they're just not used to these types of things so they don't have the structure in place and they're never meeting their deadlines that you're asking it just turns into a shit show it's just i it's right. every time and but you feel for them you know and, and it's just a it, it's just a really bad thing to put junior people on those those smaller clients um or maybe one but not all of them because that was the other thing like that you always hear is that oh they'll take all the smaller ones any revenue under 40k or whatever um you know they'll have all of these ones or whatever and it's just it just doesn't work yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So um, that's cool. So th that that sort of touches on that. Any any other things on on the big scale, like um, what you started seeing? I know you have the digitized background, so you're probably a little bit more used to it. But when you started getting up like over fifty, over sixty, I think that's where some people start seeing some like, oh, what I used to do doesn't really kind of work as much here. Any changes that you had to adjust to when you started getting into these? you know, groups of a hundred or so? Yes, it, it was a significant transition in, in really starting to, to find ways to be able to trust people more than to be involved in everything on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So, and that's hard, right? Especially in the services industry, yeah. there's so many moving parts that it's easier to, to verify yourself than necessarily rely on others and, you know, keep yourself involved enough that you, you're looking at those key things. Yeah. But yeah. Once you get up to that larger scale, it, it is very hard to, to keep yourself involved in, on a day to day or even a week to week basis on some things, at, at least 
at the level that you would like to. Right. You can't know every single status of every single project. Yeah. Right. Right. So that's. All right. Blowing up. So that's okay. I, I have the same thing. Every There's not one podcast where my phone's not blowing up all the time. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's okay. Is that a landline? I right. a, it is. My wife insists on it. No, no. We have like a, like a hill right near our house and it blocks out most cell phone stuff. And so. We, I still keep it on, especially to tr just get all the telemarketers. So. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Oh, no, no, no worries. So, um, and how about the hiring processes? One of, one of those things that Mark and I worked on, you know, we like took a year off from project work was to like, we had those career paths and the hiring processes. And, you know, we had that thing where like, you're the culture person. And, you know, so you just don't keep asking the same person for you know the same three questions every time or whatever like that did you wind up having any specialized hiring practices or things that you did to to you know spur on hiring faster or better yeah that that was definitely a key and i'd say the the fastest hiring that i needed to do was when i was at ffw so our blink reaction was uh, what it was oh called. right okay yeah we can swing into that yeah yeah so we grew very quickly there so I, when i joined it was 35 people yeah. And we needed to grow uh, very quickly to address really the demand that we were seeing. So Drupal at the time was really hot uh, and it, there was de demand that we were seeing from large clients that we wanted to address. Mm -hmm. We grew actually from 35 people to about 150, well, was more than 150, but 150 at core. Wow. Uh, in, in what time frame was that? That was in three years we did that. That's pretty yeah. fast. Yeah. yeah. Especially so, for a services group. It's, it's like, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it, it was it was really necessary for us to be very, really focused in our hiring and making sure that we weren't having the same people ask or different people asking the same questions multiple times and the time investment alone, yeah. and getting that many people through the pipeline and hiring that many people is, is huge. And we didn't want to be diminishing margin based on the fact that we weren't efficiently hired. Yeah. You're, you're taking billable resources basically. Right. Oh, I hate to talk about it like it's a business, but, right? yeah. you've, got, you've, got an, you've, got base, you've got percentages and you're trying to drive hiring and decisions based on, you know, how much allocated work people can do and stuff. So we have that thing where, you know, two, two people into it, it'll be like, you know, make sure you do it nicely, but it's just not really the right thing to do here. Right. Like we were trying to hire like a hundred people that year or something crazy like that. And I remembered it was like first or second interview. Don't waste, don't waste terrible word, but don't waste the other two people's time. If, if the first two people have, have basically said this person's not going to work here. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's a tough one, right? So that, yeah, it's tough. I always hate doing, I hate being that guy walks in the room, you know, like, Hey, so I'm going to walk you out to the door now. It's not, Right, right. It's, 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 Listen, but, I know it. You know it. Let's be you know, absolutely. And it it is an uncomfortable situation, but it's a better situation for everyone, right? So, right. yeah, I, we've we've seen situations where where folks will bring people through a full interview process, knowing fifty percent of the way through that that it's not going to work, and, and yeah. it, it becomes apparent no matter what. Yeah, you know, so it's the lack lack of investment in the the additional interviews during the day or whatever it is, it becomes apparent. Uh, yeah. So as tough as that conversation is, it's an important conversation to have and it's, it saves critical time. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's, you got to do it the right way. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, that's it's, it's, the right yeah, way. it's always tough. Cause I believe we had like the manager lunch as part of that. And it was like, actually, we're not going out to lunch. I'm just going to walk into the elevator. I'm not going to get on the elevator. <laughs> right. Nice. Here's five bucks. This is, no, this never happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's but I believe great there was the yeah. lunch because there was the, there was the we wanted to have an offer by the end of the day where we were competing. I mean, this is Bill and I both. Like we were we were competing against um, not only just the startups, but where we were literally down the street. Google, Microsoft, they all started moving in into and suddenly Cool Cambridge started becoming like corporate Cambridge, and we started getting some really big companies. We're all trying to hire these like MIT grads and all these people. So we wanted to have an offer in their hands by the time they left, maybe even get them to say yes if they were the right person. You know, so why, why do you need to go through those additional two to three weeks of bullshit, right? Like the stress, like they're going to walk out and get an offer from somebody else. And so let's, if we really want this person, let's just give them an offer that day, which is, I, I love when they came up with it. Not my idea. I love when they came up with that because, um, 
you know, we, we all wish hiring processes were that smooth. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, and that's, it's so true. I mean, the demand it consistently it, it even continues to be so high in certain yeah. roles that yeah, it's, it's, it's better for both just to, to move on and, uh, and, and get the next yeah. person rolling and let them go. When, when you were at Blake Reaction, was that when you started using more offshore as well too? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the <laughs> interesting um, story. Yeah, let's take a direct like left shift. <laughs> let's talk about, because they're the same, right? It's like, oh no, now we need to be able to tell the reasons why instead of me just, you know, suggesting them, but uh, why yeah. you sort of went down that route. Yeah. And I can tell you, I'll, I'll tell you how the transition happened to just to Blink Reaction. So uh, I, while at Acquia, I reached a point where I, I really wanted to go back to the traditional delivery that I was used to, right? Having my own team and, and being able to, to manage that team really effectively. So yeah. having the backstop again, being able to see further ahead on whether projects were going to be successful, those were really key things for me. So I ended up leaving Acquia and then really started looking to the Drupal community because I, I, I liked it. I, re I really yeah. do like the Drupal community. I really liked the, the partners we worked with. So I started talking to some partners actually, and I talked to my favorite partner, uh, Blink Reaction. And Blink Reaction, by the way, is the company that saved me on the Olympics too. Uh, oh, so, no kidding. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. I didn't realize that. That's an awesome story. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I, I talked to them. I talked to a couple other partners. So and they could get it done, right? Like, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I trusted these guys. Absolutely. So I, I knew they yeah. had key people that really were dedicated to what they're doing and really smart uh, and had tons of Drupal experience. So it was the right time. It was the right place. Uh, so I ended up joining and... Really, our goal from when I joined was to to build a wildly successful company that we either were very happy to be a part of and wanted to continue with indefinitely or to sell, right? So mm -hmm. really, the, the things that we did and how we acted were similar with either path. You know, we, we really didn't have a, a decision on what we were going to do. Um, but yeah, it's one of, and I'll say another key, different, key differentiator for blink reaction in my decision making was the offshore piece of it so yeah. that's it, they're differentiated right so I, you look around at the agency world in general and you see a, a lot of companies that are doing the same thing and and they're they have similar rates uh and similar approaches just because that that that's the this the standard path mm -hmm. uh, but the offshore model gave us a lot of flexibility in, in what we could do investments we could make and and really looking at Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe has yep. amazing technical capabilities. Uh, so uh, there was direct connection for Blink Reaction to uh, a group in Ukraine, and oh, Ukraine. Uh, okay, yeah. They were, they were full employees, uh, yep. but we had a manager that was focused there, and that, that's a key. Actually, I'll say to anyone yep. thinking about doing offshore, make sure you have a representative offshore. One hundred percent. I actually was just talking to a, a prospect just the other day. Uh, we have an offshore component in Costa Rica. They're amazing. And uh, this company had been kind of trying to start their own office up, and but they were just kind of hiring developers. And it's like, no, you you need that person. You need that that presence, you know, that's just keeping it all together there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Now, that, that was key for us really to, to make sure the team was happy, to make sure that we were hiring the right people, uh, and, and just really just to keep it moving. Uh, so... We hired a lot of great people out of uh, out of Ukraine, uh, and it was a really really effective team. Yep. And we were able to scale it quickly. And a lot a lot of the scaling we did was just based off of friends of friends, right? So there was just such a Drupal community there yep. that we were just finding people based off of somebody saying, "Hey, I know some people." And, and then we did reach a point where we we really couldn't scale as much within our with within our, our network uh, mm -hmm. in Ukraine. We started to branch out a little bit. Further, um, we, we brought on some, some folks in Serbia. Uh, so we actually aqua hired uh, a team. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. We had some folks in Bulgaria. Uh, so we, we started. Uh, the you try one over there? I, I picture you sitting in these like European cafes with little espressos and interviewing people. No, so so I, did get, I did get over to Ukraine, but it's not that. The picture you paint is not the picture, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it was sitting, not understanding a single word of what I was looking at or hearing. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> the language is very difficult. And again, <laughs> good reason to have a representative in that country. Yeah. Uh, he, he was able to bring me around and, uh, and watch out for me. 
Yeah, uh, I just watched too much Jason Bourne. I apologize for that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what was your ratio by then? Like 60% offshore, 70, 80? I'm just curious. Yeah, we, we varied. I, it was between 60 and 70% generally. Yeah. Uh, if we started to, to ramp up from there, we'd start to get a little bit concerned just about, uh, yeah. about margins and, and where we're at. So we were able to offer very attractive uh, rates based off of the offshore model. And, and we, want, we needed to maintain that differentiator. So we, we need to keep a close eye on it. Was the project oversight, like the architects and the project management onshore, and then the development was offshore? It was. And I really see that as a key. Yeah. So communication with clients, the, the, the same time zone when it comes to project management, technical architects is important. Technical architects, I did have some that were based offshore and, and were able to communicate, communicate well um, based off the time and just English language. Yeah. Uh, and that was a part of hiring too, was making sure that the English skills were, were good. No, no, it's, we, we deal with that now. It's, there's a point in time where the, the customer is going to want the developers to jump on a call every once in a while. So absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I did find for more junior developers, it was okay if their English wasn't quite as, their spoken English wasn't quite as good. Mm -hmm. um, because many people, their written English is much better than their spoken English as they're learning the English language. Uh, yeah. So using it's, it's, you know what? That, that just, God, it's just like one of the lessons, important lessons I learned on this was very recently where we were on a conference call and the customer was there and asked questions and the developer was doing a very good job. You know, he's, he's, you know his, his spoken English was very well, um, but then you realize they're speaking slower, and then we went on pause uh, for a little bit, but I think the customer had to drop, and we we're going to switch over to an internal meeting, and suddenly they all started speaking in Spanish very fast and, and fluent and going back and forth and everything, and it's like, that's right. There's that's that's a very hard thing to do, right? You're you're talking about technical concepts. You're context switching in different languages. You're doing a translation in your head and everything. It's it's such a skill, and and then it's part of that hiring and onboarding process. To what position do you put them in? How much do they talk with people? Um, yeah, it's uh, you know I just assumed like oh he speaks English. Yeah, let's just get him on the phone and do X Y and Z. And then suddenly the customer's like that was a little rocky, and you're like well you know it's not their first language, and we're talking about really complex things here. They're just doing a you know it's like you know ten five second delay for you know translating those in their heads. So right, absolutely, and it, it, it's a very uncomfortable situation for the individual that you put in that situation too, yeah. right? So knowing that they're not able to communicate the level that they want to is just it's very uncomfortable and, and I, I don't like putting people in those positions one of the things that we did was we offered english english classes uh, so oh that's cool yeah that was something that we, we found really important and was pretty effective uh, you know it becomes challenging in that you're moving at a million miles an hour and you're trying to offer classes and get people to have the time to do the classes so it's we need to make sure that there was a balance um, but yeah balance that's was, very smart do you mind talking about um percentage of billable time uh, at a, at a um, straight consulting company versus a product team. Like I'm trying to remember the percentages in my head, but uh, I remember that in deck, I think we were trying try for 70 to 75%. And I, yeah. I, so I kept those when I was at Bright Cove. And then we had, you know, any of that extra allocated time to go to like, oh, there's a company meeting and maybe you want to do some fun stuff and everything like that. A little different <laughs> when you don't have that product kind of slush fund of, <laughs> exactly exactly and that's that is a key differentiator as you say between the between those types of companies yeah. my, my target was 80 percent plus yeah. uh so and, and i was able to frequently get individual you know the individuals are working above that uh yeah. and it, it is interesting and when you don't have a product that's associated with the with what you're doing there's not any of that training or any of that you need to be doing we did have to train on the technology but a lot of the technology training was happening while folks were actually doing implementation so we'd put a more junior developer in partnership with a more senior developer and and, and have them develop co-developing basically on a yeah that's smart yeah i know i'm 100 on that so in your current situation now, are you using some of the same people or teams that you used previously, or have you had to go off and sort of create a new team? Yeah, so I am still, uh, it's funny, I, I am working in the partnership model, right? So, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I am using one team that I, I used to use uh, when I was at both uh, FFW and Acquia. So yeah. highly trusted team and their Indian based team. 
Okay. Uh, so do great work. I trust them. Uh, and then I have, I also have a Ukrainian team, uh, which I've done some projects with and uh, been very successful, but it's a different team than the team I've worked with in the past. Right. Are you just living life with, on a different time zone right now? Are you like well, Sunday night at nine o'clock getting on the phone and things or? Exactly. Exactly. I, it does <laughs> help that I do have a tech architect that's based in the U S yeah. uh, but, but I still do end up on calls that are, that are way off of the time I prefer <laughs> to be on calls at. <laughs> yeah, nothing beats my old New Zealand calls. Those are amazing. So uh, like, I can't even remember what, I think those are like seven o'clock on Sundays, seven o'clock at night, basically. Is, is yeah, right. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it does take some getting used to. Uh, the, as far as the Indian time, time zone, I've, I've never actually tried to match that one uh, very much. Uh, if, if somebody had to, oh yeah. Oof. If somebody had to ask you, uh, if somebody was saying, Hey, Bill, I'm trying to, I'm getting pitched on, on starting up a, a dev team in India or uh, Eastern Europe, what would, what sort of questions would you ask them back in to help make that decision? Uh, what is technology, right? So what technology are you trying to work in? And uh, I think there's, there's pockets of different technologies looking at you know, different areas throughout the world. Uh, so uh, I, my personal experience in, with off, offshore companies in general, um, I found that Eastern Europe was a little easier for me, at least as far as communication. Yeah. And part of that was probably time zone, right? So there was more time that I had available that overlapped with that team to, to really stay in sync. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the questions I would ask is what is your, your time, time flexibility, you know, that you're working hour flexibility. Yeah. Uh, so in, we had folks that actually worked U S time in Eastern Europe and they did it very, very happily because they, they got to work later in the day. You know, so early, early yeah. in the day, they, they got to do whatever they wanted and then they'd start later. So that yeah, I go to those fancy Eastern European coffee shops with the little saucers and the cups, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I'm obsessed with those. I got Just I, as I, you I, envision it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so have you, were you able, cause there's a big, I don't want to say prejudice, but there's a big impression in the field that you cannot give Indian teams agile projects. Is that false? Were you able to find some of that? I mean, the, the thing is, if you give something incredibly specced and well thought out um, or more support roles, what I've found is it, those teams are great for that. But I've never, I, I've not been able to find a, a great agile working relationship with, with an Indian team. The way that I have made it successful is with a good amount of U.S. support, right? Yeah. So having the, the, the onshore offshore, having the onshore project leadership uh, has, has made a difference, right? So I think that... Instead of just sort of giving the whole project over to, to India, you sort of have a blended company? Okay. Exactly. Project? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that the there's many, many technical resources in India. I feel like project management doesn't have... As, there's not as much of a focus on project management. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's my impression. That no, I, I think you're, that's probably what the issues that I've dealt with are, is that, yeah. So I, it's structuring it in that you have U.S. leadership from a technical, technical and from a pro project uh, perspective, and then having the delivery team in India that with the right communication, those people having to work yeah. off, off hours. You know, the leadership definitely has to work off hours um, to stay in communication. But I've seen it be very successful. But my my partner, my Indian based partner, is uh, does excellent excellent work. They oh, great. Agile projects, uh, and but that's because we have the right structure in place to be able to do that. Yeah, it, it sounds like if anything, if you put your your due diligence in and find the right teams, and I just could not like go fly over to India and try and meet with like five different companies and go through all of that. It was sort of just didn't have those those in place, um, and we had been dealing with some customers where. It was a blended project, you know, our team and their team and their team was in India and it just, it just didn't really work out that well. We'd have those crossovers, right? Eight o'clock in the morning, we'd have the, this exactly. is what did. can you go take this and, you know, pass the baton for the, you know, so. Right. Yeah. And it's, there's so many stories out there like that, right? It's just, you, you, yeah. hear, you definitely hear it a lot. And even you hear it about Eastern Europe too. It's just, it, it really really comes down to how you structure your team, how you assess your team, how, and what level of commitment they have. Yeah. Having, a, having a team that is onshore, offshore versus having a full onshore team, there's, there's considerations that are for both that you need to take into account. It's easy enough to think about an offshore team as not being part of your company or, or being different, right? So right. they just do the work over there and 
and we just send them work and we we provide the oversight that they need but they this they are part of your company they're part of your culture right you know, their culture is very different you know when it comes to their their actual culture that they live in but in their working environment they're looking for many of the same things and you need to make sure that that culture is is across the board and you may have to adapt it some but it's, it's yeah. important to have that common goal just like and any company that's folk, that we've been at, you know, in DECA, we had to have that common goal. And mm -hmm. it's important to maintain that even with an offshore team. Yeah, some of the things that we found successful recently is that if you're getting if you're starting off a big project, fly the team over, right? Or at least fly the leads up. Uh, yeah. Or and that, that seems to work really well. That, you know, them being with a customer, but then just feeling like they're in the culture of the company. Uh, where, where we've you know flown the team over, we've done the kickoff, then we spent like another week at our offices or two, or maybe even a full sprint or two. Uh, that that's that's been something that's that's worked really well. And every time we do it, we just do more of it. So yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And another important piece I found too, just minor, but communication mechanisms are important. So video. And yeah. so it's, it's interesting. We talked about that in the beginning. All yeah. the status calls with no video and just a phone call. And, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So a video makes a big difference and it's easy enough to fall into. I'm not going to turn my video on because I work from home and yeah. my room's, room's a mess or I, I, didn't, I didn't take a shower this morning, whatever it might be. Um, but, but I think it's important to have that video component. Yeah. So I actually shaved for you. If you had seen me an hour ago, uh, you, you might have thought you were on the wrong call. So. I appreciate that, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to see that. <laughs> well, so I think we went, pretty, we went pretty deep there for a little bit. Not as deep as when I get Mark Holland on the phone. We'll, we'll talk all sorts of ops and percentages and things like that. But that was, that was, that was great because I, I really wanted to get into some of the scalability and the onshore offshore things as well. Uh, any, any sort of lasting thoughts or lessons or things that uh, we didn't cover off on? Uh, well, I'd like to just touch on what I'm doing now. So just, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I actually was really excited when I saw your podcast um, because the way you described it is what the direction that I've gone with my career at this point. So yeah. I, I identified that same gap that you talk about as, as oh, far as you. trying to get professional services information uh, and, and really get support when it comes to professional services and how to, you know, how to build an organization, how to scale an organization, how to make decisions, how to put processes. Yeah place, all those sorts of things. So I made the decision to start my own company so called Advanced Velocity, uh, which, which is really focused in that area. So there's, there's three areas I focus in. One is professional services consulting uh, and, and also because they go hand in hand customer success. And I, yeah. I have only briefly had the title of customer success, uh, but re in reality, my career has been oh, based. I, 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 we could tell, oh my God, yeah. Oh, there's 100%, like, oh, you don't know customer success. Oh yeah, you're right, I, I don't know anything about customer success because I don't have that title in my Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, and it's, I, I've had so many of those conversations. Uh, but yeah, so I am actually, I have lots of expertise in customer success and I am consulting on both professional services and customer success and I am qualified. Uh, <laughs> he is, he's actually, he's very well called. It's, it's just funny, I, you know, there needs to be some, I was just talking with Renee and there needs to be cons consolidation because I was looking through her LinkedIn, I was like, Renee, you've got like customer experience, customer success, customer, I don't know, like enrichment, it's just like, what the industry needs to kind of settle in on what's what all of this sort of means exactly exactly it's not an or you or it's just sort of like what's flying out there these days and what some chief talent officer wants to call something so uh, yeah absolutely absolutely so yeah i'm really happy to be working in that that space yeah and, you know add to that just general technology consulting uh, working with organizations just to assess their their overall technology platform uh and also the processes they're using there and then using uh, the teams that I spoke about earlier to do uh, development too. So focus in web, web, web development area. On the success, um, and I don't want to run too long, but I'm fascinated about some of this. On the, on the success and professional services, who's, your tar who's calling you up for these? Because uh, you, know, you get contacted by people who are like, I'm a startup founder. I know nothing about this, but I know that I need it. Uh, or what sort of are those people that are sort of calling you up for those types of engagements right now? Yeah, so I'll say that we're, why this was particularly interesting to me is because when I looked at what was available out there as far as this type of consulting, the big 
the big consulting companies are doing this, right? So they'll come in, they'll do a million dollar, multi-million dollar oh, yeah. engagement to, to get your professional services to the next level. Um, but there really wasn't a focus for companies that, weren't, that, that didn't want to spend that or couldn't spend that. Right. Uh, so what I'm seeing in, is really um, some small organizations, the startups uh, I'm seeing that are looking to either start a professional services or customer success capability or don't know where to go because they reached a point where they have one, but it's not the margins. Yeah, are making. So in, in the evolution that I always see here is product company starts, has developers, they're making the product. Suddenly customer X asks for some implementation help and some customization and the developers are doing the professional services. And then suddenly they hire a project manager who's managing the developers and then, and then bill comes in, right? Is that kind of what happens? Right? Exactly. Exactly. So I'm not really sure what utilization is supposed to be. I'm not sure what margins is supposed to be, but these feel bad. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. So it, it's really, how do I scale? How do I structure? That's that. Those are the things that I'm seeing. And the, the other place that I'm seeing it is, with private equity. So private equity uh, that really buys up a bunch of different companies and they, they've got high value, but bad operation stuff. Like they've got a very good product out there, but they just need some help on the operational side. So they, they get brought in to kind of uh, take it, clean it up, make it more valuable by just running things with, with the fat, with a better operating system. Basically. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm helping out both on the, the side of, before they actually acquire. So due diligence. And then I'm yeah. also helping with, Hey, how do we actually make this, a better certain, you know, how do we make this better? I mean, private equity, they're there for a short run yeah. to, to make the company look better, to make some money and then sell it for whatever X. Uh, so my services really help them in understanding first off, what does this services organization look like? And then second, how do I bring it to the next level or 10 levels from here? This is great. You know, when I was kicking this around and I admit it took me a few extra months cause I was trying to figure out what to do and I also have a full time job, but I, I was, I'm glad I'm now I'm going to say go to bill, but I was originally going to be like, okay, let's put some like a resource center together on a website. And it's sort of like, don't send an email with the quote, use a proposal document. Like, right. like are you doing stuff like that as well too? Like, uh, like you, let's walk through like how the sausage is made on a deal. And you're like, you're kidding me. Like, I can't believe you have business right now, but everybody goes like, through it. But you your know. SOW is in a PowerPoint deck. <laughs> uh, once in a while, I will say once in a while, when you've got a, I have done that recently, but it's a very complicated thing. Oh no, it's not the SOW, right? Or but like the proposal yeah. is a PowerPoint deck because it's sort of like, let's, let's deal with, and that's the other thing. Some people just write statements of works and a legal document. It's like, no, let's, <laughs> this is like true inside baseball. So like, no, never do that. Cause <laughs> you don't want to start getting the lawyers involved every time you're trying to agree on scope, use a proposal document, put the logo of the company you're pitching to on the cover, like Absolutely. into the project, talk about what you're doing, talk about what, how you've done this before, make it successful. And then, you know, use whatever things you need to do to get everything agreed and signed off upon. Then you put it in a statement of work. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a master yeah. services agreement actually is of value and important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, then the over lawyering of some of these things because the, the attorney uh, that is trying to do their best job, but they're not used to dealing on services stuff. So they start over lawyering the like MSAs and things like that. So are you walking in with sort of templatized versions of good MSAs and SOWs and getting these people off the ground that way? Yeah. It's one of the biggest things that oh, it, awesome. earlier stage companies that I, I'm bringing lots of assets to the table right off the bat. So yeah. th those are, well, I'm finding a huge value. So, you know, simple things like kick, a kickoff deck. Yeah. Um, you referred to proposal, right? So yeah. what, what, what does a good version of this look like? So these yeah. things are just really, oh, really valuable. Oh, hey, go fly to your customer that agreed to pay you some money to do a project. <laughs> like, right. Kick right. it off, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These little things people just don't even think about that yeah. make such a difference. Yeah. And, and I'm being trying to be funny a little bit, but people just don't know until they, they do it. Right. Like I didn't know these things the first time. Like, and we did a lot of status kickoff calls at Indeca where it was just a, call, a very bad long call um, for a little bit. And then it's like, Oh, this deck is uh, 150 slides. We should probably do that in person now. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny for me now and I'm helping companies to pick vendors, right. And yeah. provide services. And I just watch some of the behaviors that they, they exhibit. I'm like, that's not the right way to do that. Yeah. It frustrates yeah. me even more. Right. Because I, I know, and I've been on that side of the table. So that's yeah. 
interesting thing for me. Yeah, the, the toughest thing for me in that regard, and uh, the last part of the sales thing is uh, when I'm getting pressure from the uh, staffing team, and I have to use that as an argument back to the, the customer slash prospect. I hate even using the term prospect, but hopefully potential customer. But it, it, because I can see somebody like you going, oh, here they're trying to do the threat taxes. But I'm like, I literally am in a staffing meeting and they don't know whether to hold these people for the next two weeks or to put them on this other project. And, and right. just like laughing your ass off. Like, oh, here's the time when the resources shortages are threat. <laughs> yeah, I've been in that mindset and I can tell when people are doing it for sure. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> and it's, you just sit there. How do you, how do you motivate? How do you motivate? And you yeah. see them doing it with the same tactics you've used. Maybe <laughs> true or may not. I'm not sure, but <laughs> I'll believe it's oh, true. You're, you're just trying to help them out. But, um, but so this was great. I, I, I was going to get into like some fun stuff, but like we already went to an hour and uh, I know your phone's probably blowing up and don't want people to fall off here. But what's one thing, non-work thing that is, uh, is keeping you going right now that you love doing? Like, oh, let's put the laptops down and do X. Yeah. So the thing that I make time for now, well, first off, be my kids, but oh, obviously. my well, wife, beyond, beyond that, uh, I, I love track driving. So I, I uh, take my car to the track and uh, I did uh, not know that. Did you ever do that with Alex back in the day? No, I hadn't started doing it then. I just started doing it a few years ago. And uh, oh, wow. it's, it's an absolute blast. I, I need situations where I'm not thinking about work. Yeah. And it, when you're sitting in a car going as fast as you can around a track, you cannot think about anything but yeah. that. That's amazing. And I'd say the same thing with the guitar. Like I come home, I turn the metronome on, I'm trying to learn something. And because there's no way you can think about work, it's the same concept. It's just, you need something. So even when you're watching TV, like people are like, Hey, do you watch like, you know, this? And I'm like, no, it just reminds me of work. Like, not that there's anything particularly wrong with it. I'm like, I just need a break to detach from it. And stuff like right. That. Right. I mean, I find it funny. I do highly stressful things to find, uh, <laughs> Find, find relaxation from work, um, but I guess that's my personality. <laughs> yeah, like skydiving, right? Like some people do that. I'm like, oh my God, but uh, wow, oh, that's great. So Bill, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the recording and this was fantastic. I'm sure we'll do a follow-up on some, some stuff you've bumped into along the way with your new gig as well too. And uh, it was great chatting with you. Great chatting with you, Jeff. All right.